and open our Bibles to Exodus chapter 32. And as you guys are turning there, I want you guys to think about, I want you to imagine that you've received an instruction, either from your mom or from your dad. Exodus 32. Great. Um, I want you to imagine you've received an instruction from your mom and dad. Either, and the, you, the instruction is clear. You know what you're supposed to do. It's not confusing at all. And you just choose not to do it. You know what you're supposed to do. You've received the instruction, and you choose not to do it. What's the worst feeling in the world? Yeah, getting in trouble, Silas? Guilt. Yeah, guilt. That, the worst feeling in the world is when they walk into you, wherever you are and they see you not doing it. You know you're in sin. You know you're going to get punished for it. And it's just that sinking like, oh, why did I do that? Um, that's what we're going to be, kind of what we're going to be talking about this morning. Uh, if you're in Exodus 32, um, we're going to be listening or we're going to be learning about uh, the time that the Israelites had the golden calf. And where we're at in the story, so last week we learned about how God had given Moses all of these instructions about the tabernacle, right? And so you would think, okay, last week we learned about how we're supposed to build the tabernacle. You'd think that this week we would be building the tabernacle, right? Nope, it's not what's happening. Uh, so let's go ahead and read Exodus 32. We're going to read verses 1 through 6 to start. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, Take off the rings of gold that are in your ears, that are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And, and they said, they is the people, and the people said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast of the Lord. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. So let's set the stage for a minute because how all of, how all of this happened is kind of important. So I'm actually going to go back and I'm going to read a little bit from Exodus chapter 19. So Exodus chapter 19, this was the very start of what's happening on Mount Sinai. So we've been, on, we've been at Mount Sinai for a few days now. And this is how God enters. On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very, lar very loud trumpet blast, so that all the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him in thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. When we got dressed this morning, we put on clothes. When God gets dressed, when he comes to earth and, and shows us who he is, he comes in fire, he comes in thunder and lightning, he comes in earthquakes, God is not like us. And so all of this is going on, and then listen what, and then he gives this command. So this is the start of the Ten Commandments, uh, Exodus 20, verses 1 through 6. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or, it is, or that is on the earth beneath or that is, uh, that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, 
visiting the iniquity of fathers on their children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who keep my commandment, who love me and keep my commandments. So God is speaking to the Israelites from this fireball, thunder and lightning, earthquake thing, and he tells them, don't make an idol. He is talking directly to them. Part of, part of the story of Mount Sinai, God's talking to Moses. Part of it is God talking to the people of Israel. This part, he's talking to the people of Israel. He is, he is speaking to them directly, and he tells them directly, do not build an idol. Don't do it. And the people understood and were terrified. In fact, Exodus 20 goes on to say, Now when the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled. And they stood far off and said to Moses, You speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us, lest we die. They were so afraid of God in that moment that they didn't even want to hear from God. They didn't want God to speak to them directly. They were so afraid of him. Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, that the fear of him may be before you, that you may not sin. The whole reason that God showed himself like this on Mount Sinai is to help the people to, to appear before them so that they wouldn't sin. And what did they do? At like the first opportunity, they sinned. They did, like, they didn't even make it to the bottom of the Ten Commandments. They, they failed at number two. Uh, so as we think about this, point number one, uh, avoid idolatry by remembering God's character. There's a few things that the, that the Israelites did um, that we need to make sure that we're avoiding. So going back, to, going back to our section in uh, Exodus 32, the Israelites replaced God. They wanted God, they told Aaron to make gods who will go before us. Now there's a problem with that. They had a God who was going before them. Remember the whole like pillar of cloud by day, pillar of fire by night, and it was in front of them and leading them and showing them where to go? They already had a God who was, who was going before them. And then they attributed what God had done to Moses. They said, as for this Moses who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, uh, did Moses do all of those miracles? Did Moses create the plagues? Did Moses part the Red Sea? No. Who did? God. God used Moses. Moses was the vehicle. Moses was the prophet that he used. But it wasn't Moses. And then they showed what they really wanted. They wanted to have a God who would give them what they wanted. They, they wanted to have a feast and celebrate and have basically a giant party. And so that's what Aaron gave them. Aaron proclaims that the next day will be a feast to the Lord. And that's really what the Israelites wanted. They, just, they didn't want a God who gave them Ten Commandments that they had to obey. They wanted a God who was going to give them food and water and make their lives happy and peaceful. But the problem with that is, that's not who God is. And so as we think about um, what we need to learn from that, we need to avoid idolatry by remembering who God is. The Israelites, yes, if we saw God in a pillar of fire and thunder and lightning and an earthquake, we all would be very scared, just like the Israelites were. But the fact that we can't see it with our physical eyes doesn't mean that we, won't, we can't understand it and we can't see him with our spiritual eyes. We, need, we, we can lay hold of God. We can see him. We can imagine him in our minds, in our hearts, through faith. This isn't to say that we can fully understand, but God has given us descriptions of who he is and what he looks like. 
And so for most of us, if we were there and we saw the, the fire and the lightning and the earthquake, and mind you, this is still happening. Just because Moses is up on the mountain, God is still there. Like the Israelites who are having this party and, and Aaron who's carving this, this golden calf could still see the fire and the thunder and the lightning. It was still going on. God was still talking to Moses while all of this happened. And so for us, as we think about how do we make sure that we're not being foolish like the Israelites, foolish and falling into idolatry, the, the first thing is we need to remember who God is. Uh, by remembering who God is and what he's done is the only way to make sure that we're not falling, falling into worship of a false god. The second way that we're going to look at is by focusing on God's mercy. Yes, God gives laws. Yes, we have to obey him. But he also gives mercy. And when we don't meet it, when we, because we can't, uh, God will forgive. Let's read what God says to Moses and then how they respond. So picking up in Exodus chapter 32, verse 7. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down, for the people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now, therefore, li let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, in order that I may make a great nation of you. But Moses implored the Lord God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say, with evil intent did he bring them out, to kill them in the mountains and consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven. And all this land that I promised I will give to your offspring, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing on his people. So how do we avoid idolatry? First, by remembering by remembering who God is. Second, by worshiping our merciful God. Point number two, worship our merciful God. A few things that we need to pay attention to. God saw all that the Israelites had done. In the, in the story, in the image that we were talking about to open our time, where we were talking about how God, or how if your parents give you uh, an instruction and you don't obey it, you have the opportunity to, your parents can't see you. And so as long as you do it eventually, you can get it done. But it's not that way with God. God sees you all the time. He knows when you don't, when you don't obey, and he can even see into your heart which is a scary thing because a lot of times it's easier for us to say, yes, mom, or yes, dad, and obey than it is to have a heart that wants to please and, and submit to God. But listen to, what, listen to what God says when he sees their sin. He said, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people, now, therefore, let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them. We all know, growing up in church and coming to church, that God will punish sin. I think sometimes we forget just how seriously God takes our sin, though. And for many of us in this room who haven't yet repented from our sin and haven't yet submitted to Jesus and submitted to the Father, we're still under that wrath. What God was saying about, let me alone that I might destroy them, that I might wipe them from the face of the earth, that's some of you guys in this room. Some of you in this room are in a position where if God were to come back today, you would be someone who received his wrath and not his mercy. 
Now, fortunately for the Israelites, they had Moses. And Moses went and he asked God to relent, not to do, not to, not to bear their wrath, not to be angry with them. And God relents. But notice what Moses does. He doesn't say, he's not asking for forgiveness so that they don't have a consequence or so that their lives aren't uncomfortable. He's pointing them, he's pointing God back to himself. He points to God, he appeals to God's glory that he, that he would be known among the nations that, that the Egyptians would see and say, what God is this? Why did he do this? And he appeals to God's faithfulness. He appeals to the promises that he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Moses is more concerned about God's glory than he is about any, whatever the consequences are for the people. And that's a lesson for us. A lot of times we think about our obedience as a way for us to avoid a consequence. And we don't think about the fact that our lives, especially as believers, are a reflection of who God is and what he has done for us on the cross. Now, we don't have Moses. But who do we have interceding for us as believers? Yeah, Silas. Yeah, we have Jesus. We have a better intercessor than Moses. That's not to say Moses was a bad intercessor. Obviously, God listened to him and God relented of his wrath. But as we think about um, our intercessor, let me read a few verses from Hebrews. He said, The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he, Jesus, holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Moses died, and he wasn't there to intercede for the people anymore. Jesus died, but rose again, and now he lives forever. If we have Jesus as our intercessor, if we repent of our sin and turn to faith in him, he is always there for us to, make, to, to intercede for us before the Father. Continuing from Hebrews 7, For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily for his own sins and for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. Later we're going we're gonna to read about how Moses offered to do just that, to, be, to bear the punishment for Israel on their behalf. And God says, no. The beauty of the gospel is because of Jesus' perfect life, God says yes to that request from, from Christ. That through Christ, we can have forgiveness, that he can take our punishment, and we have a better forgiveness through him. Because we, as we move on to our, our next point, we're going to see that God relented from the fierce wrath, from destroying them completely, but there were still consequences. So we're going to pick up reading Exodus 32, verses 15 to 24, or 15 to 35. Then Moses turned and went down from the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hands, tablets that were written on both sides, on the front and on the back they were written. The tablets were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God, engraved on the tablets. When Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, There is a noise of war in the camp. But he said, Moses said, it is not the sound of shouting a victory or the sound of crying defeat, but the sound of singing that I hear. And as soon as he came near the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, Moses' anger burnt hot, and he threw the tablets out of his hands and broke them on the foot of the mountain. He took the calf that they had made and burned it with fire and ground it to powder and scattered it on the water and made the people of Israel drink it. And Moses said to Aaron, What did this people do to you? that you have brought such a great sin upon them. And Aaron said, Let not the anger of my Lord burn hot. You know the people, that they are set on evil. For they said to me, Make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So I said to them, Let any who has gold take it off. So they gave it to me, and I threw it into the fire, and out came this calf. Uh, quick side note. Does anyone recognize... I? I took the gold, 
I put in the fire, and out came this calf. Does that happen? No. No, it was a lie. It was a lie. Uh, was it a particularly good lie either? No. Not convincing. Yeah, not convincing at all. And when Moses saw that the people had broken loose, for Aaron had let them break loose to the derision of their enemies, then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered around him. And he said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Put your sword on your side, each of you, and go to and fro from the gate through the camp. And each of you kill his brother and his companion and his neighbor. And the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses. And that day... About 3,000 men of the people fell. And Moses said, Today you have been ordained for the service of the Lord, each one at the cost of his son and of his brother, so that he might bestow a blessing upon you this day. The next day Moses said to the people, You have sinned a great sin, and now I will go to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. So Moses returned to the Lord and said, Alas, this people has sinned a great sin. They have made for themselves gods of gold. But now, if you will forgive them sin, If you will, forgive them sin. But if not, please blot me out of your book that you have written. But the Lord said to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. But now go, lead the people to the place of which I have spoken to you. Behold, my angel shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will will visit their sin upon them. Then the Lord sent a plague on the people, because they made the calf, the one that Aaron had made. Write this down for point number three. Accept the consequences of your sin? Question mark? There are consequences for sin. We see here that the consequence for Israel's idolatry was 3,000 of them died, and then God sent a plague on the rest. God is holy, and he is just, and he cannot just ignore sin. There has to be punishment. There has to be justice but the reason there's a question mark there is because you don't have to accept the full consequences of your sin you can be forgiven someone else can bear the consequences of your sin Jesus died so that you could be forgiven as we put our faith and hope and trust in him as we repent of our sins and submit to him as we surrender the authority of our lives to obey him, we can be forgiven. As we think about the picture that we had when we opened, what's the worst feeling in the world when you've sinned, you know you sin, and the worst feeling is getting caught? But what's the best feeling after you get caught? It's when you don't get punished for it. It's when your parents show mercy and they forgive you, even when you don't deserve it. You have the opportunity to have that relief, to have that weight lifted from you. You have the ability to be forgiven. God wants that for you. God wants that so much he sent his own son to die for you. And Christ suffered a horrible, brutal death so that you could have, have access to that forgiveness. It's my prayer this morning that you guys would all repent. Turn from your idolatry, trash your idols, and worship God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. Lord, we learn that our hearts desire to worship things that aren't you. God, forgive us for those sins. But Lord, we also thank you that you have made a way of forgiveness. We pray, Lord, that you would allow these kids to see their need for a savior, that they would repent and submit to you, God. We pray these things in Jesus' name.